I'm, I'm for the techies here. Is this isn't this isn't a mic for the speakers? Okay. So I need to stay here. I can't move around. I can't. If I see you falling asleep, I can't slap you upside the head. It's none of that. None of that's good tonight. Okay. I'm not good at staying in one place, but I'll try. All right. If if I get close, then I'll just speak up. Is all right. Good. Listen. Really good to be with you tonight. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and spend a bit of time with you, just talking about evangelism, talking about gospel conversations, gospel life, however you want to put it, right? You know what evangelism means, right? You know where it's from, what it means, euangelion, good news, right? So when you evangelize, you've probably thought about this before, but when, when we talk about doing evangelism or evangelizing or evangelism or whatever, so when you evangelize, literally, literally what you're doing when you evangelize, is you are good newsing people. Is that not a great thought? Is that, I mean, come on. It's good, isn't it? Does it look like it's good? Look at me like it's good. It's good. It's a good. You're good newsing people. You're good newsing people. That's what you're doing. Now, we'd sometimes say, well, you're good newsing people to death, but you're not. You're good newsing them to life. You're good newsing them to life. And I just, I, I love to try to keep that thought in my mind because. You know, for me now, what, 42 years ago, somebody went out of their way to share the good news of the gospel with me. Before that, I had never really heard it in a way that I could respond to. Um, I probably never really heard it in, in a biblical way. And then somebody loved me enough. Somebody loved me enough. And, and, and I, I won't go through it all with you, but... but 42 years ago, I wasn't in a good place in life. I was not in a good place. Um, life was a bit of a mess for me 42 years ago. And I don't know if I would have approached me, if you know what I mean. But this guy, just somebody I didn't know, I was at university, went out of his way, and he just came with the good news because he knew that it was good news. Fair. Is that all right? You can say yes, you can say amen, you can respond, you can throw stuff, you can just... Look like you're alive, okay? That's all I want is just look like you're alive. And so somebody, this guy loved me enough to give me the good news. So I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled. You're going through your, your values or your core kind of fundamental kind of principles. Super. I'm glad this is in there. If you were going through your core fundamental principles and this wasn't in there, I'd be worried about you. All right? But I'm glad this is in there. And um, we're going to take a little bit of time just to look at it. Um, tonight. Okay, so let me just dive uh, right in. Okay, John 4. So turn with me to John 4. We're going to dive right in. I've only been given an hour and a half. So, see, now that woke you up, didn't it? That woke you up. That woke you up. Okay, we're going to try and get through this. I've got 10 points tonight. Um, usually I struggle with three points to stick to my 45 minutes. So that's putting this in context, okay? So pray for me. We're going to just really run through this. But I do want to read the passage for you because it is God's word that has the power and not necessarily my words about God's word, although we've prayed that the Holy Spirit would have his place in all that we do tonight. But let me just read this passage for you. It will be familiar. It will be familiar. John 4, you'll know, you'll undoubtedly know um, what's happening here with Jesus and his, his witness to this woman um, at the well. Um, and and I, as I read through this, I want you to think, I want you to think um, a couple things. I want you to listen and think, what is Jesus doing here? Okay, because that's really what it's about. What is Jesus doing? How is Jesus doing what he's doing? How's he doing this? I want you to think, what's going on with this woman? All right, I know, you know, most of us probably haven't had a life like she's had. But if at all possible, let's try to put ourselves in her shoes tonight and just try to think from what we see in this passage as John records it, well, what's going on with her? Okay, what's, what, what, what's going on with her? What is, what, what is she thinking as Jesus interacts with her, as he has this gospel conversation with her? Okay, and, 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 and then maybe consider as we're going through this as well, how, how does your own approach to good newsing people look as compared to what's going on here, okay? Now, this is just one encounter that Jesus has. The, 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 the Gospels in particular are full of encounters that Jesus has with many different people, right? 
So, and they're not all the same. So we're only looking at one. So this isn't, you know, this isn't one size fits all. This is just Jesus, who we're not. We carry his spirit with us. So there should be some similarities, right? Some, but there's some things that Jesus is able to do here and that he's able to see here that we're not. So we've got to realize that and, and bring, you know, you have to take those things into consideration when you're applying scripture to your own life. If this is Jesus and we're looking at Jesus, he is our example, but there, there, there's a limit to why, you know, I'm not Jesus, right? We're not, none of us are, we're not God. So we have to draw the line in the correct place and say, right, we need to imitate Jesus as best we can imitate Jesus, where, where there are things that we need to know that we can't know. We have to pray. We have to ask Jesus, the Spirit, to help us, right? Because we're all just humans, and we have those limitations that Jesus didn't have, um, being human and divine at the same time. So just think about all that. That's a lot of stuff I've asked you to think about here. Already, Some of you are already looking puzzled. But, but try to just keep those things in mind now as we read this. Try to let's read it and think about it with fresh eyes tonight because you'll know this story. Okay, I'm going to read it and then we've got 10 points and I've got about 20 minutes to get through 10 points. So um, that's going to be hard, but here we go. So Jesus, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he'd made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples... He left Judea, that's where he was. He left Judea, and he departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground which Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, human divine, human divine, being wearied from his journey. Think about evangelizing and, you know, what life just looks like for you, right? It gets weary. So just, this is good, the way John tells us these things. Being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. She's, the woman didn't bargain for this, did she? Something. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship 
in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Something in that. So now, yeah, right? Not one size fits all. And so I've never quite had a conversation like that with a woman at a well, right? I've not had quite have a conversation with like that with a woman or at a well or with anyone for that matter. Um, but there are loads and loads, I think, of really, really good things here that I think we can learn, some principles we can learn. And it's not one size fits all, but some great principles that we can learn that certainly from time to time help me to think about how I'm just going to go on living in this world as a follower of Christ and affect those around me for eternity. Amen? Amen. That's, so that's kind of where we're going and what we want to do. All right, so here we go. We're going to have to move fast. This is early on in Jesus' ministry. Don't forget that. It's early on in Jesus' ministry. So um, people are becoming aware of who he is, right? Because this is chapter 4. What happened in chapter 3? Who did Jesus talk to in chapter 3? Remember that? Nicodemus. Remember that? And he's a Pharisee, comes to Jesus at night. He's, he, he recognizes something's going on, but he's still a bit in the dark. No pun intended. He comes to Jesus at night, right? He's still in his person. He's a bit in the dark. He, doesn't, he knows something's that's going on with this guy, but he's, he's, he's got a lot of questions that need answers. So most people that we meet, um, well, maybe, maybe that's not fair to say nowadays. Maybe that was what I would say 30 years ago. Most people, you know, they know something's going on with Jesus. Most people probably have heard his name. And I know there's places in the world where nobody's even heard, they've not even heard Jesus' name. But let's stick with where we are for now. Um, people who probably have heard his name, something's going on with this guy. Who is this guy? Um, but have a lot of questions, a lot of misconceptions. And, and so true for, for, for this um, woman. Okay, so... Um, Nicodemus, Jesus, two, two totally different encounters here, chapter 3, chapter 4. Um, Nicodemus, you've got, a, you've got a, 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 a one guy who's at the, the, the kind of righteous end of the scale, the Pharisee, the righteous end of the scale. Here you've got a woman at the totally other end of the spectrum, isn't it? And I, I like that because I wonder if, if John, in framing chapters 3 and 4, isn't just trying to tell, tell, me, tell us, look, guys, everybody's in on this thing. Don't put people in boxes. You just go from one end of the scale to the other when it comes to good newsing people, right? Don't, you don't have to just go to people who think they've got it all together. You don't have to just go to people whose lives are a mess. Just everything in between. Just one. I love that. One end of the spectrum to the other. And yet in both of these cases, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, Jesus is digging deep into somebody's heart. Isn't he? He's the, you watch the way. We're not going to look at chapter 3 tonight. We don't have time to do it. Nicodemus, he's just drawing him out, drawing him out, drawing him out, drawing him in, drawing him in. And he does exactly the same thing with this woman. Beautiful, beautiful um, examples here. Great gospel um, conversations. Okay, so here I want to give you really quick 10 observations, okay, of, uh, of good gospel conversations. 10 observations of good gospel conversations. Now, if we were to look in chapter 3, we'd probably have another 10. So there'd be 20, and on and on and on it goes. But we just have time to look at this tonight. So here's 10 out of probably many, many different observations, principles, if you like, for just living life for Christ and just bleeding the gospel all over the people around us, which is maybe the best way that I can put it, okay? So 10 quick observations here about good newsing people, good newsing people to life, okay? So here's, oh, there's all 10 at once. Um, I didn't want that, but let me just um, read through it here. I'm just going to give you one at a time. I thought my, when I set this up, it was one at a time, but... I'll give you all 10 at the end. Okay, number one is this. Always be ready for a gospel conversation. Always be ready for a gospel conversation. Um, I, I know that I'm not always ready for a gospel conversation. I know that I'm not. So I try to pray every morning. Um, I try to pray. I, I don't know what you pray in the morning. I hope you pray before you go out into your day. Something. Help. You know, Lord, help. Even if it's that. But I try to praise a few things that I pray. And one of the things that I pray is that the Lord would give me strength, that he would strengthen me to be a, a, a good shepherd for my congregation and a good witness for Christ. 
and a good husband and a good father. And, you know, so I've got a list of things that I pray. But two of the things, a good shepherd and a good um, witness for Christ. That I would see and seize every opportunity that I have for Christ. I just pray that. So then I'm a bit on my guard. I'm a bit ready. Lord, help me be a good witness for you today. Help me to see and to seize the opportunities. That, I don't pray for opportunities. Um, that may sound strange to you. I don't pray for opportunities because I just know that my day is going to be filled with them. It's going to be filled. I don't have to pray for opportunities. If I go stand at the bus stop, that's an opportunity. If I go and fill my car with petrol, that's an opportunity. Right? If somebody during the festival stops and asks me if I would like to take their leaflet, I got one in my back top pocket. That's an opportunity. So I know my days. Maybe you want to pray for opportunities. Fine. It's not unbiblical to pray for. I just don't because I know my... I pray though, knowing that they're coming, I pray that the Lord would help me to see them and to seize them. Because sometimes I'm blind to them. And sometimes even when I see them, I don't seize them. Why? A million different reasons. I'm scared. I'm tired. I'm fed up. I don't know what to say. I'm insecure. Just same reasons as you. Right? Maybe, maybe, if I'm honest... Before man, I feel a little ashamed. Even though when I analyze that, I feel ashamed that I'm ashamed. Right? Okay, so always be ready for a good gospel conversation, never knowing um, when one is going to come. 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. Now think about that verse. Be ready, right? To give an account when somebody asks you for the hope that's in you. Why are they going to ask you for the hope that's in you? Think about that now. Good question, isn't it? Why would Peter, why is somebody going to ask you for the hope that's in you? How are they going to even know that there's a hope in you? Come on, come on, guys. Why, how are they going to do that? Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that's in you. Why would they ask you about the hope that's in you? Think, think, think. I know it's late. Think. What? All right, they're going to see something. They're going to, you're going to say something, live something, behave in a certain... Right, so you're going to be living your life with Christ. People are going to see that, and eventually somebody's going to say, well, you know, are you a vegetarian? Why are you living this way? And you're going to be able to tell them, no, I have a hope. My, you know, why, how can you have this composure with what's going on in your life? And you'll tell them. See, is that right? Okay, so you're with me. Be ready, be ready. So you notice this whole thing. Watch this. This whole thing here in chapter 3... This was never planned. Now, Jesus may have, you know, he's God. As far as we know, as John sets out, it was never planned. At least on a human level, it was never planned. Okay? Jesus and his disciples are not sitting around developing strategies for reaching women at wells. Did you notice that? They're not sitting around, okay, today's strategy is going to reach women at wells. That's not what's going on here. In fact, it's not even on the radar when they leave Judea. Jesus is just moving on because evidently he doesn't want to hassle with the Pharisees about who's baptizing who. Do you notice that? And so he's just moving on. It's just life is just happening to Jesus. So he doesn't want to hassle with the Pharisees over who's baptizing who, John's disciples, his disciples. And so he moves on. It's getting maybe a bit hot in Judea. Not literally, but, you know, metaphorically for Jesus, it's getting a bit hot. And he's going to move on. That's just life is happening is the picture here. So all this is, is a change of circumstance that opens a door for an incredible opportunity for the gospel. And that's often the way it works, isn't it? A change in circumstance. A change in circumstance. And sometimes the change in circumstance is not pleasant. A lot of times, right? Our lives change. Circumstances change. We're praying from now. I'm on WhatsApp as I'm coming over here. Not literally while I was driving, but they were coming in. And we're, there's a, one, of our, one of our women is in the hospital, and she's been in the Royal Infirmary for a number of weeks now, and, and her circumstances are changing, and yet as they change and they move her to new ward, she's meeting more people and telling more people about Jesus. It's just, just changing circumstances in life give us incredible opportunities for the gospel. God just sometimes shakes things up in our lives, and before you know it, somebody's getting saved. Okay, I could give you a long, I don't have time to give you my testimony, but I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My brother, me and my brother are two siblings. Mom and dad weren't Christians. I went to university. This guy brought me the gospel. I got saved. I went home with the gospel, now believing that mom and dad and my brother Mike needed to get saved because I was saved now, and I wanted them saved. And you can think, what well, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm good newsing them to death, probably. I want to good news them to life, but I'm good newsing them to death. 
And eventually just, it was too much. I had to, you know, just slow down. They were, they didn't really want to hear anymore, but just through a whole different set of circumstances. My brother and I had been into drugs. He got addicted to drugs. He had to go in for drug rehabilitation. My mom and dad felt their whole world had fallen apart. These incredibly black clouds descended on our family. And within two years, everybody was saved. Everybody was saved, all four of us. God just used you. At the time, we just, at the time, I'm praying, wait a minute, Lord, I'm praying for their salvation, and everything's falling apart. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. Well, just hang on. Be patient, right? God's not, it's not my, it's not my timetable he's working to, it's his. All right, just be, the point is, be ready. Be ready. God shakes things up, be ready. So that's number one. Number two, I will put them up here. I'll give you, I'll give you the benefit, but don't go reading ahead. <laughs> just stick with me on the point we're at. Okay, and make believe the other ones aren't up there. Otherwise, you're going to go ahead and you're not going to hear what I'm saying. Okay, second observation. Never restrict God's gospel generosity. Never restrict God's gospel generosity. Do you know what I mean by that? In your heart and your head. Don't you restrict it. The text says here, watch this. Because this, when I started getting into this a few years ago, preaching through John, this just stopped me dead in my tracks. The text says here that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Did you pick that up? Look at your text. It says it in different ways. He needs be to go through. He must have had to. It basically says he had to go through Samaria. Except that can't mean here that there were no other options for where he was going. Because the Jews regularly didn't go through Samaria. You with me? They regularly went around Samaria. That was their route. So you, as soon as you read that, you should be scratching your head. Something's going on. Why does John say that? Why does John say he had to go through Samaria? The Jews hated the Samaritans because they interbred with the Gentiles over the years and, and that was an anathema. And so they avoided the place completely. But now here comes Jesus. Look at this. Here comes Jesus with the message of eternal life. And guess what? He has to go through Samaria. Wow. Just, just let that sit with you for a minute. He has to go through Samaria. Why? Because he has to tell people about eternal life. He has to. He has to. Doesn't matter that the Jews avoided Samaria. He had to tell them about eternal life. Because if he didn't, who was? Whoa, whoa, right? How many Christians are in your workplace? How many Christians are in your family? How many Christians are in your neighborhood? Right? Unless you live in a Christian neighborhood, right? And the name of your street is Hallelujah Court or whatever else, right? Which most of us don't. Probably means that there are very few Christians in your neighborhood. You know what that means? If you don't tell them, who will? Who will? You're the only... For years, I worked for the U.S. government, Department of Defense. I was the only Christian in my office. Only Christian in my office. And I knew that, and they knew that. And they let me know that they knew that. But I was the only Christian man. And I reminded myself again and again and again when I walked into that office on a Monday morning that I was taking the Holy Spirit in there with me. And before I walked into there... Humanly speaking, I know God is um, um, uh, he's, he's omnipresent. I know that, right? But in a human sense, before I walked into that office, the Holy Spirit wasn't there. When I walked in, he was. Isn't that something? Before you walk out on your street, Holy Spirit's not, you know what I mean. I know that he's everywhere. But in that kind of indwelling sense, you bring him in with you wherever you go. Uh, powerful stuff, guys. Powerful stuff. He had to go through Samaria. Wouldn't it be great if that's what we were like? Where I have to talk to this guy. Because like, people would just say, no, you don't. He's a pain in the neck. Don't talk to him. Right? You know, you don't have to talk to this guy. No, you're so passionate about the fact that you have the words of eternal life. You're an ambassador for Christ, right? You have the ministry of reconciliation. You say, I have to talk to this guy. I think we need the, those kind of prayers. God, make us people that feel like we have to. We have to. You notice that the woman is shocked that Jesus is talking to her. Did you notice that? She's shocked that Jesus is talking to her. Jews didn't talk to Samaritan. Men didn't talk to women. Not like this. Not at Wells. And Jesus blows both of these cultural absurdities right out of the water, doesn't he? Blows them right out of the water. And I'm not saying it's bad to share the gospel with your own kind. That's great. Because I think doctors need to get in there with doctors. Pilots need to get in there with pilots, right? Um, but don't restrict God's gospel generosity. Some of the best conversations I've had have been with, with the most unlikely people, 
very different from me, out of my circles, yet some of the greatest gospel conversations. You never know whose heart God is touching. You never know whose heart God is touching. So don't say, no, they'll never listen. Who are you to know that they'll never listen? When that guy approached me, Scott Holloman was his name, in, 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 in 1980, when I was a fresher at university, and he approached me, believe you me, the state I was in, I was the most unlikely guy to receive the gospel. But he told me anyway, and here I am now. That just, listen, don't restrict his gospel generosity. Okay, third observation. It's always great if you can level the field when you're sharing the gospel. It's always great when you can level the playing field when you're sharing the gospel. I hope you know what I mean by that. Do you see what Jesus does here? What does Jesus do? Jesus is Jesus. He's going to tell her in a minute that you know that Messiah you're talking about? That's me. Right, so he's going to blow her out of the water in a minute. But before he does that, look what he does. Look what he does. Leveling the field, leveling the field, coming down to her level. Leveling, he's God. So he's infinitely up here, she's here. What does he do? He asks her for a drink. He doesn't go in there and just say, you need a drink. Okay, well, sometimes that's what we do, isn't it? Sometimes we go in, we're the Christians. I'm saved, you're not. I got what you need. So listen up. <laughs> right? That is, sometimes that's how we do it. Right, well, sometimes we don't mean it that way, but sometimes we get that kind of Christian arrogance. We get that Christian arrogance, don't we? I've got what you need. I just, what, who do I think I am? I've got level up. He asks her for a drink. Really, really. It's another thing that just shocked me here. He asks her for a drink. He's, he's almost by doing that, putting, putting himself in her debt. He asks her for a Putting himself in her debt. He asks her for a drink. Isn't that really, really interesting? Maybe it doesn't seem like a big deal to you on the surface, but this would have shocked the living daylights out of this woman. It would have shocked the living daylights out of this woman. And she, she responds, you wait, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman, you're asking me for a drink. You've got to read into this, folks. Read into this. Get what he's saying. You're asking me for a drink, she says. Almost like he's given her the upper hand. She has something that he feels he lets her know on a human level he needs. Really, really interesting. I love this. You can just read right past these things, folks, if you don't stop long enough to think about them. She is, he's saying to her, you've got something I need. Could you help me? Please, could you give me a drink? I'm a human. I need some water. Isn't that good? And then we march in there with, you know, I'm a Christian. I've got salvation. You need to be saved. Now, that's true, but I'm not quite sure that's the best way to go about it. Is it? Really, really, really interesting. Very, Jesus, totally undemeaning Jesus is here. Um, and so we got to just take that right. It's an acknowledgement here that everybody has, has we, we talk about tolerance, don't we? We talk about tolerance. We, we talk about, um, you know, uh, just, just I've got what you need or, or being arrogant with the gospel or whatever. You know what happens when you level the, the gospel playing field? When you level a gospel playing field, positive tolerance, positive tolerance. You know what that is? It's the acknowledgement. When you level a gospel playing field, positive tolerance. Okay? Um, negative tolerance is um, that, that, and this is, this is going around a lot nowadays. Negative tolerance is we're being told that um, everybody has to be, everyone's opinion has to be treated as equally right. Well, I, I can't tell somebody they're wrong. I, I have to treat, I, I, have to, I have to let other people know that their opinion is right. I can't just say, I disagree with you. I have to say, no, 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 I affirm you. I affirm you in your opinions. That's negative tolerance. I affirm you in your opinions. Okay, this is not positive tolerance, is this. Positive tolerance is the acknowledgement that everybody has an equal right to their own beliefs. Got that? Positive tolerance. Everyone has an equal right to their own beliefs without acknowledging that everyone's own belief is equally right. Does that make sense? It's acknowledging everyone has a right to their own beliefs, but not acknowledging that everyone's own beliefs are equally right. Okay, so you level the playing field. You have a right to that belief. You have a right to just level the playing field. You have a right to that belief. But we know that not every belief is equally right. Okay, we just heard from Acts 4.12. 
There's no other name under heaven by which men, men, not might, could, would, should, must be saved, Peter says. Really, really good. Okay, number four. I got to keep going. Time's up already. Okay, always get your colors up on the mask as soon as you can. You know this one? Always get your colors up on the mask. Gospel conversation, get your colors up on the mask as soon as you can. Um, you know what this does? It Usually it gives you a good indication if your gospel conversation is going to go any further. <laughs> right? You get your colors up on the mask as soon as you can. Let people know where you're coming from. It'll give you a good indication as to whether or not it's worth going any further. I remember going to Romania a few years ago and two different scenarios, me and the guy with me. If you think I can talk, this guy could talk me under a table. And we're traveling over to Romania and we're stopping off, I think it was in Brussels, and we went for, to, to the cafe for a breakfast and we got into this conversation with the waitress and she was really open and we chatted to her about Christ and we left her with some literature and we went on our merry way rejoicing just that we had had this great opportunity with this woman. Got on the plane to fly to Romania, <clears throat> and, and, and I'm sitting in the middle seat. My friend's at the window, and this guy sits next to me on the aisle seat. I can't remember exactly where he was from, but um, I, 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 I kind of lifted my colors to the mast. You know, I was going to, to share, um, talk about Jesus with these folks in, in Romania, and he just turned to me and just said, right? He said, here's the deal. You're not going to talk to me about that on this flight. Whoop, that was it. That was it. You're not going to talk to me on this. So lift up, put your colors on the mast, and if the door opens, run through it. If the door shuts, you've, you've nailed you. You're still waving your flag. You're still waving your flag. Okay, so that's kind of, it's really, really interesting. Jesus just lifts it up, doesn't he? Um, Will you give me a drink, he says. woman says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. If you only knew, Jesus said, nails the coast to the mast. If you only knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you'd have asked him. And he'd give you living waters. The flag's going up. See it? The flag, if you only knew. The flag's going up. She could just have said, I don't care who you are. I'm going back to Sychar, where I come from. Could have. And like, you know, like the, the rich young ruler, Jesus would have let her go. Her choice. Isn't that interesting? Okay? So that's, get your colors up quick. Number five, be prepared. Gospel conversations. Be prepared to be misunderstood. Sorry. But it's just the truth. Be prepared to be misunderstood. Jesus lays the living water on the line to this woman here, right? And what happens? She goes, oh, you're the guy with the living water. Oh, you can save my soul. No, Jesus talks about the living water and goes right over her head. Did you see that? She doesn't get it. She doesn't get it the first time. She doesn't get it the second time. She just keeps misunderstanding. <laughs> Jesus, this is really interesting because if you go back to chapter 3, same thing happens with Nicodemus. What am I going to do? Crawl back up into my mother's womb and be born again? He just, whoop, really, really interesting. Just be prepared to be misunderstood. It might take some time. It might take some explaining. Um, it's just not necessarily humorous, but, you know, um, if the woman misunderstands him. You don't even have a bucket, she says, verse 11. How are you going to get water? Where are you going to get water from? Just misunderstands him. <clears throat> One of the things that become crystal clear when you start sharing the gospel with people is how massive the misconceptions are out there. Right? How massive the misconceptions are out there. Right? We live in a street. There's no other Christians. They see us going out every day, in and out, to, every Sunday, in and out to church. Every Sunday. For 25 years, we've lived there. Out, in, out, in. And the neighbors watch this. In and out, and in and out. And over the years, we've been able to invite, when our girls were little and we had a baby dedication, we invited them to church. And some of them came. Some of them came. My daughter got married in July. My younger daughter got married in July. And we, we live streamed the wedding. And we sent it out on the WhatsApp to the community, to all the neighbors. So if you want to watch, Wayne's going to do the wedding. He's going to marry his daughter. Oh, that really interested people because they'd never come to church. But they see me and I'm in my garden and I'm in my shorts and I'm cutting my grass. And they're thinking, well, who is this guy? He's not any kind of minister. I know. You know what I mean? And all these misconceptions. And they watched the service on the TV. And up to the conversations that we had after that, you just never believe. I, that was your church? I, that was great music. That was, that was your, there were people there. Like every church I've been to, like nobody comes. You know, it's just, it, it's just the misconceptions are absolutely all over the place. And so with this woman, and I think so with, with our conversations. Back to that Peter passage, right? Make a defense for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. 
Gentleness and reverence. If you look at that word gentleness, it's more like just meeting people where they are. Meeting people, be ready to answer their questions. They're gonna, you're going to tell them you're a Christian, they're going to have a clue what you mean about that. You're going to talk about the Bible, they're going to have loads of different misconceptions. It's full of errors, it's, it's bigoted. It's, have you ever read it? No, 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 but you know, somebody told me. It just, just church, I go to church. Oh, I would never go to church. I, you know, last time I went to church, there was six people there, and the you know, hall held like 5,000 and something. We just all sat, and it was just terrible. It was boring. Uh, you know, just misconceptions, right? So get ready for that. Number six, make people thirsty. You have to, right? Make them thirsty. Listen, the passage is about water, for goodness sake, isn't it? Come on. The passage is about water. Make people thirsty. The whole thing here revolves around the subject of water. Verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Right? And just because the woman doesn't get it to start with, listen, just because a woman doesn't get it to start with doesn't mean Jesus gives up, does he? He just keeps drawing her in and drawing her in. And drawing her in. Make her thirsty. He just keeps drawing her in. He doesn't say, well, listen, you don't understand, so I'm going to go find another woman at another well. He just draws her in, draws her in, so that he then can show her that he's the bucket to the well, to the water. He's the bucket to the water. And he's going to get there. He's going to get there. But he makes her thirsty. Number seven, people have to see their need at some point, right? This guy that came to me 42 years ago, he had to... Guide me with truth so that I would see that Jesus had something that I needed, seriously needed, that nobody else could give me. That nobody else could give me. Right? You have to, at some point, as you get into these, you got to get there. You can't just be nice to people, serve them. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to do. But... You know, the, 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 you, you can't just keep doing that. I'll just think, you know, oh, you must be Buddhist because I've met nice Buddhist people before. You know, no, no, I'm Christian. Oh, you're Christian? Really? I've never met a nice Christian. You know, whatever. <laughs> just keep helping them to see their need. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, the, it's the bad news that makes the good news good, isn't it? Think about that. It's the bad news that makes the good news good. So you got to help them see their need. Paul says everybody sinned and falls short of God's glory. And for, for this woman, what could have been shorter than, of God's glory than five husbands? What could have been shorter from God, than five husbands? Right? And Jesus, he points that out to her. He knows what he's doing. Go get your husband. He, he's drawn her in so that she'll see her need. What could have been a greater need? You've had five husbands. Your life is a relational train wreck. You need some help, lady. You need some help. And she knew that. Of course she would have known that. She might not have confessed it openly, but she, deep down in her heart, you better believe this woman knew she needed help. Of course she did. Of course she did. Incredible. So, um, help people see their need. Number eight, no one's ever too short to go beyond the reach of God's grace. Fair? Nobody's ever at a place where they're beyond the reach of God's grace. Um, the well of God's grace is deep, isn't it? The well of God's grace is deep. Have you ever touched the bottom of the well of God's grace? Have you ever touched the bottom of His grace in your life? Remember that little game you used to play when you were kids and you'd jump into the water and you'd, you'd see if you could touch the bottom? Remember that? Right? I don't think anybody, in fact, I know none of us, will ever touch the bottom of God's well of grace. It just, it's infinite. So you're never going to touch the bottom of it. So this is beautiful here as Jesus begins to finish up with this woman. Um... He shows her, even this promiscuous Samaritan woman, he invites her to be saved. He shows her even for her. Who would have thought she was way beyond. I meet people like this, right? We have a breakfast service for homeless people every Sunday morning. And loads of these guys that come in on a Sunday morning feel like, oh, I could never be a Christian. You know, you're a nice guy, Wayne. You can be a Christian. I could never be. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a hundred times. I could never be a Christian. I'm, I'm too far gone. I'm, we just have to show people. Even, even upstanding looking people where we work and live and, you know, you don't know what's in their hearts. A lot of people just feel like if you knew what I did or what I do in the shadows, in the dark places, if you knew how I've treated my kids, my wife, my husband, people, 
God. You, he turned his back on me in a minute. Just never to, even for this, this story's here for a reason. You got the Pharisee on one end of the spectrum and you got the, even though they're both actually on one end of the spectrum, aren't they? They're both lost as geese. Aren't they? Did geese ever get lost? People say that all the time, but they're just lost as, as geese. Never beyond the reach of God's grace. Number nine, we're almost there. Destroy as many barriers to the gospel as you can. Destroy as many barriers. Do you notice what the woman throws up here? Do you notice that what she throws up as a barrier? No, you should watch this because it, it, this story doesn't read very smoothly, does it? It's almost like the woman's not hearing what he's saying. She's bringing up stuff that's not even in the context. Did you notice that? They said, what is she doing? So you have to take some time to go through this. I, I, you'll have time to go through it again this week, whatever. But look, look at what, what barrier does she throw up here? Where does she throw up a barrier? A couple of places, but one of the places I noticed here, she throws up this whole thing. Jesus makes the point to her about the water and the well. and All of a sudden, she throws this thing up about whose mountain is better to worship on. Like, what? Like, where, where is she? Look at this. You say, where did that come from, lady? Where did that come from? Incredible. Right? Because there's one between the Samaritans and the Jews or whatever. The animosity is, is between them, whatever. Our, worship, our answer is verse 20. Worship on this mountain. You Jews claim that it's on that mountain. And Jesus essentially just says, lady, forget about mountains. We're talking about water. Stick with the subject. You notice how people do that? You, you start talking about Jesus or whatever. Whoop! You have ever happened with people and they'll, they'll come up with it. You just start talking. With, why, do, why are you talking about that now? Because I don't want to talk about Jesus. So I'll just change the subject. It happens all the time, folks. So remove the barriers. Remove Because the, they're going to put up barriers. Barriers. Do whatever you can to stop the barriers. Yes, Jesus says, salvation is from the Jews, but he says it's not exclusively for the Jews. Did you notice that? So he doesn't deny it's from the Jews, because it is. Jesus is a Jew. He's got to admit that. He's got to admit the truth. But it's not exclusively for the Jews. Yes, Jesus saved my soul from my sin, but not just me. Not just because I look like a nice guy and my hair's cut or whatever. It just, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's for everybody. What a way to win, win this woman's heart. The time's coming and now is when true worshipers are going to worship in spirit and truth. Forget about mountains. Spirit and truth is what God is seeking. I love it. It's powerful. Get rid of those barriers. Turn to God with an open heart. And finally, always help people to see the urgency of the gospel. Always help people see the urgency. I think Jesus did this. He helped us see the urgency of the zero room for procrastination. Zero room for procrastination. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to take a course. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to wait till you're old. You don't have to wait till you're rich. You don't have to wait till you're perfect or whatever it is. You just have to know that Jesus has come and he's died for you and he's risen from the dead and one day he's coming back. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Urgency, urgency. Verse 25, the woman said, I know Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll set everything right. He'll explain everything to us. You notice that? When he comes, when, 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 when. Usually the people, when, well, maybe when I'm, when. Woman was the same way. When, when, when. Jesus says, forget about that. I'm here. Isn't that beautiful? I'm here. I'm here. I get to all people who say, you share the gospel with them. They say, well, why, you know, what about somebody who lives on a desert island? And nobody else, you ever get that one? And nobody else lives with them. And, oh, and they live and die on a desert island. And my response is usually, look, I've never met the guy, personally. <laughs> Maybe he's out there, but I've never met him. But can we put him to the side just for a minute and let me talk to you? Because you're not on a desert island. And I am telling you the gospel. Don't worry about him just now, right? Let me just talk to you. Let me live my life. before. It's not just, it's just, just listen, it's just, just Jesus living his life, isn't it? He's just living his life. And he's, he's just, circumstances are driving him here. They're trying, I got to go through Samaria, right? Just living his life. And yet the number of things that you can just learn by watching him in action here is unbelievable. Those are just 10. Read through this again this week because I've had to rush even though I've gone over time. Read through it again. Pick up another 10, right? And next time when you share the talk, then you can try to get 20 into 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, so let me pray, and then I think there's some questions. Sorry to take up more time than I should have. Father, thank you for um, John, who's recorded this for us. Thank you for moving him by the Spirit to record these things for us, and ultimately for our Lord Jesus Christ, um, from whom there is just an infinite amount that we can learn. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged, enthused, 
inquisitive, on our guard, ready, dependent on you, loving other people, um, that as tomorrow dawns for us, we would be one step closer to being more like Jesus in taking advantage of every gospel opportunity that you give us. Help us now as we just spend some time thinking, talking a little bit more about this, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, for your patience and your ears. Appreciate that.